Yoena Nihia, Yoena Nihia. My name is Nancy Oakley. I am a Mi'kmaq and Wampanoag artist. I'm living in Eskasoni, which is the largest First Nation, Mi'kmaq First Nation Reserve in the world. It says so on our sign. I've been here for about 30 years. Before that, I lived in Massachusetts with my dad's tribe, which is the Wampanoags, were the ones that met the pilgrims. My dad was the Grand Chief of the Wampanoag Nation for years, and he gave it gave it up to bring my mom home. So, been here ever since. And you didn't you never heard anything about Megamog pottery. There was I think I think a thousand years ago was when we stopped making pottery. You would see maybe a little tiny piece in I think of Natural History Museum in Halifax piece about that big but they have a whole section on on the quill work and the basketry because of that i'm taking something that we thought was forgotten and trying to revive it my name is um, richard zane smith but in in um, in wyandotte my name is soha Hio. that was given to me in the longhouse in wendage quebec and i live in uh, eastern oklahoma some of the traditional arts that i've do um, pottery, woodworking, bow making, and arrow making. But uh, ceramics is really my my specialty, I guess, and I've been doing that for over 40 years, all hand building, uh, and I've been making a living by doing this for over 35 years. And when I look at old stuff, the old pottery, and when I look at the old sherds, uh, those are things that speak to us. You know, we look at those things and we see that that motion of a, f- a finger mark or a drag tool mark, you know, from a bone hall. And those are things that we connect with, you know, because that's motion. That's our ancestors' motion in action, preserved in clay. And those things are like living. It's like it's like hearing a song from the old past, the distant past, when you see things like that. When we do what our ancestors did, it's a way of kind of like sitting next to them again. What we're seeing is kind of a reawakening of all these, all these, these forms, these things that have been suppressed are now being sprouted. Patsy McKinney, and I'm Executive Director at Under One Sky Friendship Center here in Fredericton. I'm Mi'kmaq from Northern New Brunswick. I'm very much a modern indigenous woman. I love learning more about who we who we were from our perspective. It just brings me more pride in who we are. And it's because not every child is born to be pr- proud. I mean, I'm a living example. My whole family is a living example of that. And so, um, you know, my philosophy is in the absence of pride is shame. So the philosophy here uh, and under one sky, and especially the Head Start, is to give as much of that pride um, to these little kids as we can in, in their identity. And the earlier that happens, the better it is for them, because we know once they hit mainstream, the bulk of it's going to be knocked out of them. I'm not a traditionalist, um, but I'm I'm sort of reconnecting to some of that that stuff from my from my heritage and love it. Just absolutely love it. My name is Cora Woolsey and I'm an archaeologist. My specialization is in indigenous ceramics, primarily in the Maine Maritimes region, from about 3,000 years ago to about 500 years ago. I work on trying to understand what needs people were meeting with ceramics. And I do that by dissecting the technology as much as I am able. So trying to understand what the pottery would have functioned as. So would it have been a cooking technology? Would it have been storage? And I try to understand how it changed through time to meet uh, people's needs as the cultures were changing. I feel that there is a significant value to archeology span in the way it can be used to share artistic and cultural art forms and culture forms with modern people and cultures. Cora Woosley has helped me by sending her thesis on, um, or parts of her thesis on um, Mi'kmaq pottery. So that's where I was learning how, you know, the mussel shell and things like that was our main temper. Um, she's some pictures of the shapes of pottery. 
So I've been very privileged to um, get to know Nancy uh, Oakley and to get to know uh, Richard Zane Smith, who are both fantastic um, artists and potters and other things. They uh, have actually taught me a ton of stuff about the things that I study. So I have been so pleased to have that relationship because I'm I'm learning a lot from them. They say that they learn a lot from archaeologists and I believe them when they say that, but I, I think that actually we learn more than, uh, than the artisans learn from us. You know, the archaeologists have all this knowledge because they see this stuff every day. They're digging it out of the ground, they're processing it, they're doing samples, they're scraping off residue from cooking, you know, I mean, there's so much going on there and the technical skills and all that, but they don't necessarily know a lot about clay. They don't know the process of building. Something that I kind of came up with by looking at uh, these patterns, you know, that I, that I found on the old Shawnee pot. So often archaeologists would say, well, it was a cord wrapped stick. And, you know, you can do it with a stick. I've done it with a stick, but not very well. But if you have a piece of river cane, which used to be everywhere at one time, then you put a spindle through it. And the reason I say that is because when we were looking at the collections in Kentucky, they put all these bone tools out on a table. And I was looking at one particular one, just, and it caught my eye because it was very straight. And it had some little grooves in it, they were kind of worn down. And then I started thinking about it, and I thought about the cord-wrapped um, pottery, and I thought, you know, rolling those, those sticks, and I thought, what if that was used as a spindle? The spindle was put through the cane and you could just roll it. So I did I did some experiments and I, I found that it's not only is it good for stretching the clay going over, over a vessel, but when you turn it over and you start adding coils and you start building this way, you can use it as a one-handed rolling pin and you can stretch the clay going upward too. I think there's a lot of good things about archaeology, but there's a lot of bad things. I think archaeology... And, your, and some of the theories are just really just based on your own personal belief system and consciousness and try to adapt it to someone else's. I am non-Indigenous. I have a, an Irish and Scottish and Dutch background and English background. So, of course, I have to be very careful about talking about uh, indigenous culture and the indigenous archaeological record um, because it's not it's not mine to talk about except as far as what I see evidence wise a belief among the indigenous people uh, well pretty much everywhere uh, in North America that people have been here since time immemorial and so it's it's really important for me as an archaeologist to not take that and say Oh, yeah, well, we have evidence for people being here from about 15,000 years ago. So that's basically what they mean by time immemorial. No, that's not what they mean. They mean that they have been here since the beginning of time, basically. There's no way for me to say that that was the earliest time, especially considering that our, in archaeology, we just keep on finding more and more evidence that pushes that early date back even earlier. We've had terrible experiences with anthropologists and archaeologists coming here, coming here to Oklahoma, coming even to our homelands, um, and just, you know, becoming the expert of everything. When we work with archaeologists, obviously, we want to see, we want to see a sensitivity in those people who, um, who are, especially when they're looking after our remains. Uh, I'll tell you right now, when we reburied I'm just going to make a conservative estimate of 800 ancestors we were buried in uh, from the Rom. When we, when they put out the tray of burial goods that were supposed to go in that grave, it was just a little smidgen of things. I mean, it, that to me was an eye opener. Like, where's all the grave goods? And it really bothered me that they're tucking away some stuff that just like, oh no, we can't put that back in there. These are not um, treasures. Uh, these are gifts that were given by our ancestors to be put in the ground uh, for our ancestors and we want, want that to be restored. There has been a lot of uh, 
political jostling over the last few centuries to try to uh, move Indigenous people into a position of not having very much uh, say in what goes on. We are almost always viewed externally from what it looks like for Euro-Western philosophies, what that looked like for them. My experience with history on my people was we were this wandering band of nomadic loincloth wearing people. If it hadn't been for European contact, we wouldn't have made it. We had well-developed uh, societies, well-developed territories, political systems. We were brilliant, but that isn't how we got pro portrayed, right? The public doesn't really want its perceptions of Indigenous people challenged. People found a way to take ceramics and, and put temper into them and fire them to just the right temperature so that they would not crack under thermal stress in a campfire. And um, that this technology was not possessed by Europeans up until about 200 years ago. That This is a technology that is now being used by uh, NASA to send, you know, uh, shuttles into space, and when they when they enter Earth's atmosphere again, they need protection. And what are they using? They're using that exact technology, these ceramic tiles that are made in that exact way. They, it's hard for people to accept that the technology was not primitive. That's what it is. People think of the technology as primitive, and it's hard to challenge that. People who've come in, they've snatched up a bit of culture of ours and then they zoom off and disappear. They win the trust of an elder and they zoom off, they get published, the stuff comes out on paper. A lot of it is, you know, like, I didn't say that, I didn't say it that way, or he's, he's making it sound like I said this. And so there was this disconnect for so many years about anthropologists and archaeologists. I mean, the words were just like dirty words around here. Um, but today it's different. It's really different. And I think we're, we're really happy about that. The younger archaeologists that are, that are coming out of the universities and they've been trained to be culturally sensitive. Um, they're a joy to work with, you know. They're interested in what we have to say. They're interested um, in learning from us and not just like teaching. Because the reality is we, I, we can't do this alone. We, we can't make any of the changes alone. Cora took us on an archaeological survey. So we weren't digging anything. We were just we were just out walking around. So what Cora did is what reconciliation is. And it isn't a, a bunch of fluff and talking. She actually took me out there. She didn't have to do that. And that was incredibly meaningful. And we don't get enough of that. That's how I think it needs to change and to make, for people to be aware of what our position could be in that. It's not about taking it from them and giving it all to us, but we could share it for sure. In your sense of how is archaeology helping with my pottery or with my art form, how are we describing archaeology? Is archaeology from the formal written theses of people, or is it from the traditional knowledge passed down, that's a form of archaeology to me. Um, is it from the, the things you see around you? It's not a one-sided relationship that it might have been in the past. I think it's, we're exchanging ideas and things like that, which I find so, I'm thankful for. I'm very grateful for that. In that way, I feel like both the archaeology is brought to life and the indigenous traditional knowledge is augmented is you know also brought to life i feel like the two can really lift each other up we are starting to see more indigenous people who are going after that degree you know and they start a summer maybe working with an archaeologist uh, doing digs and you know cleaning artifacts and they kind of i kind of like this you know i really enjoy this and People are encouraging them, man, we need you in there. You know, we need somebody to oversee those things, you know, because to have our own indigenous peoples out there 
rubbing shoulders, you know, it kind of keeps things, keeps people a little more alert. Indigenous people who are educated in archaeology should have special training in how to talk to archaeologists and how to ask questions about the archaeology that's being done. For instance, is this necessary? Is this work you know, necessary. What are you going to learn from it? How is it going to benefit Indigenous communities? What's your What's your perspective? What's your bias? What is your framework that you're carrying into this work? Indigenous people never get the opportunity to ask any of that stuff, and and never really get the opportunity to realize that they should be asking those things. So to me, that's the next stage: is having archaeologists have a constant dialogue, a constant conversation with Indigenous people so that there is a real Indigenous voice in archaeology.